us today. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, vegetable gardening is my favorite topic to talk on. Um, I mean, there's no vegetables that are fresher, more tasty, and more nutritious than homegrown organic vegetables. And it's all the more satisfying to eat vegetables that you've uh, prepared yourself. So today I'm going to talk all about vegetable gardening, including the, the soil, what vegetables to plant, when, where, and how, talk about watering, fertilizing, and a little bit on harvesting and pest control. Um, so if you're not a vegetable gardener at all, I should cover all the basics. And even for the people that are more experienced, I'm sure I'll be giving some tips that you haven't heard before. Um, now, I would like to leave mostly questions towards the end so I don't get too far off track. But if any of the people that are watching me live have a specific question about something I just said, go ahead and put it in the chat because I don't mind being interrupted just to clarify on the point that I'm making that doesn't make sense or you need more clarification. Go ahead and put the question in there and I'll answer that question because um, otherwise you're probably not going to remember all those questions till the end. So if you're going to start vegetable garden for the first time, one thing to know is that vegetables like lots of sun, full sun. So you have a choice of where to put your garden. Put it in the part, part of your yard that gets the most sun possible. And you might need to check that out by seeing how the shade is during the morning, afternoon, evening, but more sun, the better. Uh, vegetables do not grow well in full, full shade and they're definitely not house plants. And there's three places you can plant tomato uh, um, vegetables. You can do it in the ground, you can put it in a raised bed, or you can do it in containers. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, containers, the bigger, the better. Um, if they're at least a foot deep, they'll usually handle just about any vegetable. Uh, the containers definitely need to drain, so they need to be holes in the water in the bottom so water can drain out. And you, you fill the container just with potting soil that you can get in the nursery, and that'll be fine for um, containers. Do be aware that plastic pots and ceramic pots don't breathe, and so they hold water longer, and there's a, a greater risk of overwatering while terracotta and wooden pots, they do breathe, and so they'll, they'll lose water more quickly. So they have to be modern more quickly and there's a greater risk of underwatering. Uh, the other option is in ground. Now our soil in San Diego is not very good for vegetable gardening or just about anything else. So if you're gonna plant, plant it in native soil, you're probably gonna to need to amend it. Ideally what I do is dig it all up down to about a foot, filter it through a screen, of a uh, half inch to a quarter inch screen to take out all the rocks and weeds and bottle caps and whatever else is in there. And then mix it 50-50 with garden soil. You'll know you've got the right stuff in the nursery if it actually says mix 50-50 with native soil and then put it back in. If that's too much work to be digging up and filtering it, at least work in some of this garden soil into the soil uh, because the native soil is not gonna be very good for growing vegetables. Uh, the way that most people grow vegetables is in raised beds. That's to avoid our nasty soil we have. And they're usually made out of lumber, usually about a half inch wide and a foot high, and anywhere from four to 12 feet long that's put into a rectangle, usually about four feet wide and anywhere from four to 12 feet long. Pine works fine, redwood, redwood will last a lot longer, although it's more than twice as expensive. So you just build a frame that sets on the ground. Still I'd amend the soil that's underneath the box a little bit because the roots of some plants will extend beyond the 12 inches. Um, and so you still might wanna work some uh, garden soil into the native soil for the roots that get down that far. Another tip for you if you're making a raised bed is to put a screen on the bottom if there are any gophers, gophers in your area. Got putting like um, poultry mesh or other kind of wiring on the bottom when you set it down and the gophers can't make it up into your bed. That's only if you have gophers in your area. If you're in the city, it's probably not an issue, but out in the rural areas, we do have plenty of gophers. Um, so those are th um, three options to start a garden. Uh, let's see if I missed anything on that. Yeah, okay. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is the soil because good garden soil makes a big difference in the quality of your vegetables. In fact, Vegetable gardening is basically soil tending because what you're doing is you're mending the soil, you're fertilizing, you're watering, you're weeding, you're planting. Everything you're doing is in the soil. Above ground, you don't have much control over that. You can't control the weather. About all you're doing above ground is checking for pests and seeing when things are ready to harvest. So the soil is what you're working and how well you work that makes all the difference on how good your vegetables will grow, how many vegetables you'll get. Now, um, 
Ideally, the soil will drain well, but retain moisture. And, and one thing that makes a big difference of whether it drains well and retains moisture is the structure of the soil itself. Structure of the soil has to do with the size of the particles in your soil. On one extreme, there's clay soil that's very fine, gets easily packed, and the water tends to not soak in very well. If you put water in your garden and it just sits there for a couple minutes and it doesn't go down, you probably have too fine, too packed, hard packed soil. At the other extreme, there's very loose soil, like sandy soil. And for that, the water can run right through without it hardly getting wet and doesn't retain water well. So in both cases, if your soil is too fine or too coarse, it has the same solution. You need to add organic material, that is decaying plant matter. Compost is best. If not, you can buy things at the garden shop, amend or garden soil or planting mix that mixes into that. With the fine soil, that kind of breaks it up so the water can get through there. And for the really um, coarse soil where it's going through quickly, what you've added in will absorb moisture and hold it because you want the moisture to, once the soil to be staying moist all the time. And the plants also need air, not just water. Um, uh, if, if they're sitting in muddy water, they'll, they'll rot and organic plant anaerobic organisms will prosper and they'll uh, rot out the roots that has to drain through. So uh, the roots need moisture all the time and they also need air. So it needs to be loose enough for there to be air throughout it. Um, I think fat will cover most of the soil. Um, Uh, one other thing I'd say before starting is if you have an extent, if you already have a raised bed or a pot, you might need to add some additional uh, soil to that because over time the soil breaks down and gets the smaller part particles and condenses. So even though you filled your, your pot or your raised bed to start off with, after a couple of years it's going to go start going down a few inches. So you might need to add some more uh, potting mix or garden soil just to bring it up to the to top again. So that's getting your soil ready. Then the next thing you need to do is to fertilize. Um, every time before you plant, you should fertilize. You should assume that whatever's there before is used up most of the nutrients, so it's time to put fertilizer in. Um, so you use a good balanced fertilizer, an organic fertilizer, and I'll talk a little bit about organic gardening shortly, um, and follow the instructions. One mistake people say is, well, I, I'm willing to pay for twice as much fertilizer and then my plants will grow twice as big. Well, no, we can assume that the fertilizer companies want you to use up the fertilizer as quickly as possible so you can buy some more. So they're not gonna advise you to use less fertilizer than is ideal. So generally is the case with uh, gardening is read the instructions and follow them. And that includes with fertilizer, how much fertilizer does it take? And fertilize the entire garden area. If it's a raised bed, fertilize it all. You don't just dig a hole and put a little fertilizer and put a plant. You want your whole garden area to be constantly fertile and moist. So as a plant grows, it's constantly growing into moist, fertile soil. So you put a layer of fertilizer, and usually on the bag it'll say how much per square foot, and you have to do a little math to figure out how much, and you lay it out on the surface, and then work it into the soil slightly so that you have uh, the soil uh, fertilized. Okay. Um, you don't, just one other top on fertilizer, just to mention that um, in the winter months, if you're not going to grow anything, you can put in a cover crop, crop sometimes called green fertilizer. There's various things like alfalfa and beans and things that you can grow. And then in the spring, you turn it into the soil and it's a natural organic fertilizer. So I just want to mention that there is the possibility of a cover crop to fertilize um, naturally. And I won't get into that in too much detail. Most people don't do that. Um, and don't worry about pH. Don't worry about the acidity or alkaline nature of the soil. The amendments you added are, are pretty neutral. And so you don't need to really worry about that. Um, and when your soil is really wet, don't work it then because then you're likely to release all the air and and the soil becomes more compact. So don't work the soil if it's very soggy. Okay, now, um, good garden soil is not just dirt that you add amendment to and add fertilizer to. 
good, healthy garden soil is actually living soil. It's actually full of microorganisms, bacteria, mycorrhizomes, and other organisms that, that provide, they're like a little city. It's an ecosystem in and of itself. And that's a healthy environment for the plants. These microorganisms break down plant matter into substances that the plant can absorb. Some often even live on the roots and aid the roots. And sometimes the roots will even secrete some um, sweet substances to feed the, these microorganisms. So think about it as a living environment, a little city underground uh, that you really don't want to disturb. After you've been fertilizing, watering, growing things, the organisms will come. And a lot of fertilizers, the organic fertilizers, actually have long lists of what to add to them. I think I can... Um, see on the bottom of this list, all these different microorganisms that are in the fertilizer to uh, help that living community uh, to keep it alive. Um, and because you don't want to disturb that um, environment, I'd advise no-till gardening. That is, when you initially get your soil properly, you might be working things into the soil. But once you've got proper soil structure, you shouldn't need to mess with that anymore. And you stir up the dirt as little as possible. Um, people used to think that in between they'd put a shovel in and turn it upside down. Well, that's literally turning that whole community upside down. And things are exposed to air that shouldn't be and some gases get released. So once you've got the right structure, then you disturb as little as possible. When you fertilize, you just work it into the first few inches. Sometimes you can even do it with your fingers so that you're not disturbing uh, what's going on down below. You dig what you need to to plant a plant, but otherwise you let the soil be a natural, healthy soil. And even in commercial uh, farming, they're learning this lesson. We've probably all seen pictures of tractors pulling the blades, right, digging up the soil. Well, more and more they're learning that that does a lot of damage to the soil um, and hurts the microorganisms in there. Um, so I'd recommend non-till um, gardening. Okay. So let me talk a little bit about organic gardening, um, which I recommend, the UC recommends it. Basically organic gardening is gardening in ways that are in harmony with nature, the way it happens in nature, and not doing things and introducing things that are, don't happen in nature. A man's made a lot of chemicals that they can put into the soil, uh, but they can really do some damage to the soil, to the microorganism, to the environment. In some cases, in cases of pesticides, it can even damage you with residual, residual pesticides. So the idea is only put things into the soil and on the plants that are, that are low in toxicity and exist in nature. So you're kind of growing in harmony with nature, which is what the plants want. Uh, the two biggest areas of problems are, are commercial fertilizers and commercial insecticides. Uh, one of the problems with the commercial fertilizers is they're very potent. They can sometimes burn the plants and they can seriously disrupt your little city down there with these heavy doses of, uh, of the uh, <clears throat> nitrogen in particular that you put into the soil. On commercial farming, there's a problem with runoff that when they get rains, all this uh, fertilizer gets into streams and can pollute, pollute it, cause algae blooms, kill fish. That's not going to be an issue for your home garden. You're not going to have enough runoff to spoil the San Diego River or wherever your uh, water is running to. So that's not really an issue. Um, but just the organic gardening is likely to keep a healthier garden. The more important thing is when it comes to pesticides, because that's where you can really do some damage. A man has, invest, uh, has invented some very toxic, broad spectrum insecticides that will just wipe out the pest but also kill a lot of other um, organisms as well, including beneficial organisms like pollinators, like bee, which are bees and moths and such. And also realize that um, every, everything that feeds on your plants is fed on by something else. They're all in a food chain. Your garden's at the bottom of the food chain and whatever's eating your plant, there's something eating it. And if you kill the predators as well as the pests, the pests will come back quicker than the predators. So the predators will not build up in numbers until the pests come back. And so you could end up with a worse pest problem than you start off with by killing the beneficial insects they really needed to uh, keep the pest population down. And the other problem, of course, <clears throat> with uh, 
toxic insecticides is they can even be harmful to people. I mean, the U.S. government puts limits on how much residual pesticides can be in vegetables that we consume that, that are considered a safe levels. But hey, wouldn't it be better to eat vegetables that don't have any poisons at all? Um, so try some organic gardening and maybe you can have uh, vegetables that you don't need to worry about. Maybe you're poisoning yourself when you eat them. Um, now, how do you know if you're getting something that um, is organic? Now, you know, in the grocery store, you know, you have these little things, this little, these little, uh, you know, circles that they're half green. The government regulates what you can call organic, but only for things consumed by humans, what we eat and drink. If we don't eat fertilizer, it doesn't apply to that. So in the garden shop, you'll find almost nothing with that label on it. Um, because it doesn't apply to that. Occasionally, um, seeds, there's a package of onion seeds, and there's the little label on it. Honestly, I don't know why that label's on that package of seeds, because I don't know anyone that buys a package of onion seeds for an afternoon snack. Um, but that's about the only place you'll see that symbol is occasionally on um, seeds. So how can you tell for the garden products like soil amendments, fertilizer, pesticides are good for organic use or not. And what you look for instead of a little green circle is you look for this, OMRI, which says OMRI listed for organic use. OMRI stands for Organic Materials um, um, Review Institute. It's a private nonprofit organization internationally that will certify a product as being appropriate for organic gardening. Um, companies do not need to apply for that. It's kind of like the good seal, good housekeeping seal or approval. Remember that one? Where companies apply for that and they get it on their product. Co uh, companies can apply to get that on their product, uh, but they don't have to. So if you see a, a product that says for organic use and it doesn't have that seal, I would buy that over a product that doesn't say it's for organic use. The way you know for sure that it's good for organic use is if it has that seal on it. And most of the big companies that make products for organic gardening do put that little emblem on, on it. Sometimes it's down in the corner on a container, but that'll let you know, yep, that's the real thing um, for organic gardening. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I think you got it. So you got your soil in condition, you got it fertilized, you brought just organic products, you're ready to start planting some vegetables. The nice thing about San Diego County is we have the mildest climate of anywhere in the United States of America. If you live in the mountains, you know, it might get some snow or get really hot in the desert. For most of San Diego County, you can grow vegetables year round in San Diego, unlike most places in the country. Um, but there's no vegetable that grows well at any time of the year. But all vegetables are divided in two, into two categories warm season vegetables and cool season vegetables. Warm season vegetables, you start planting in the spring around April, about now, and you harvest the vegetables through the summer until the fall, about October. And then October, you start planting your cool season vegetables through the winter until the spring around April or so. Um, almost all vegetables are, um, are annuals, not perennials. That is their lifespan is in in months, not years. So they will die off during their season. That's what they naturally do to come back next year. Um, now, how do you know whether something is a cool or warm season vegetable? There's a couple of handouts that are connected with this. One is this um, vegetable planting summary. Um, the thing about this summary, it was, just, it was made by the master gardeners in uh, Sonoma County. And we're a little bit different here in San Diego. So there's another handout that's included in that, which shows the planning times for San Diego County. So I would use this instead of this for determining when is the best time to plant your cool season and warm season vegetables. It'll say um, coastal area and inland area. Coastal areas anywhere within a few miles of the coast. Inland areas, inland valleys. The, the, the difference in timing is not much different. Um, but I'm going to tell you that the secret of how to tell a warm season from a cool season plant, because uh, by the way, 
if you you can try growing the vegetables in the wrong season, but it's like swimming upstream. That's not when they're supposed to grow. Um, the warm season vegetables like long days, sun high in the sky, lots of heat. The cool season vegetables like the sun lower in the sky, shorter days, cooler temperatures. If you, if you put the vegetable in the wrong time, it's just not going to do well. But here's how you tell the difference between a cool season and a warm season vegetable. And once I've told you this, you should be able to tell me immediately whether vegetables are cool season or warm season. And it has to do with what part of the plant you're going to eat. If you're going to eat the fruit part of the plant, that's a warm season vegetable crop. If you're eating any other part of the plant, that's a cool season crop. Now, some might be saying fruits. I thought we we're talking about vegetables here. Well, the fruit part of the plant, plants that fruit get a certain size and they have a blossom, blossom gets pollinated, the blossom falls off, and right behind the blossom is a green uh, lump. It could be certain could be round, it could be long, and it grows up into this meaty vegetable thing that contains the seeds. That's the fruit part of the plant. So that includes such things as tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, peppers, beans, right? That's the fruit part of the plant, the part that contains the seeds that, that comes after the blossom comes on. Um, cool season crops do not even produce a fruit at all. Um, so if it produces a fruit and that's what you eat, that's a warm season crop. And those, by the way, are the most popular ones to grow. Squash, tomatoes, um, peppers. And of course, we're getting that season. We're getting to the season where you can grow the most popular vegetables. Cool season crops, like I said, are ones that you're um, eating any other part of the plant other than the fruit part. And that includes your root crops, like onions, carrots, beets, radishes. It includes all your greens like lettuce, cabbage, Swiss chard. Um, it also includes broccoli, cauliflower, celery. And what, like I said, all of those plants, if you leave them in the ground long enough, they will eventually flower and go to seed, but the flower won't fall out. It'll just produce seeds without any food around it and it'll drop the seeds to the ground. So all of your vegetables will flower, but it's the ones that make the fruits that you eat those are the summer ones. Anything else is winter. Now, there are a couple exceptions to the rule. One is sweet potatoes, which is clearly a root crop, but it likes summers. And the other one is peas, both shelling peas and sugar snap peas. That's a cool season crop. That is the fruit part of the, the plant. Um, green beans are a summer crop. The peas are a rebel. They're breaking the rules. And so they're a cool season crop. Um, so in the winters, I usually grow some... Um, beets, carrots, onions. I do some cup lines of lettuce, some spinach, broccoli and cauliflower, and um, snap peas. Right now, I've got hundreds of snap peas, more than I can eat. I'm having to give them away to maybe. In the summer, I usually grow tomatoes, peppers, um, squash, um, pole, pole beans, corn. Corn's not really a flower, but it is the seed part you're eating. Um, Okay, so before planning, I think it's a good idea to uh, make out a plan for what you're going to plant and where you're going to plant it in your plot that's on the ground or raised bed. You can do it in your head, but I recommend that you write it down. You have to do a little diagram to see what you're going to put there. Um, one thing you'll think about is what vegetables do I actually like to eat? I mean, what I usually buy at the store, that's probably what you most likely want to grow. The other thing you have to consider, of course, as just talked about, is this the right time of year to plant it or do you need to wait to plant that particular crop? Another thing to consider is spacing. Uh, how much space is that plant going to need when it gets large? Oftentimes when you first put little plants in the pot, it looks like there's not much there, but you have to imagine what it's gonna look like when they're fully grown. Tomato plants can use a couple feet each. Zucchini squash can get four feet across a single plant. Um, in the guide that I attached to this um, does include spacing of how much they should be spaced apart. Uh, so when you plant it out, think about how much space they're gonna need when they're fully grown. You don't want them competing for moisture, nutrients under the ground. You don't want them competing for air and light above ground. So you want to give them enough space that your vegetable plants do well. Another thing you might consider is successive planting. And that is rather than planting all your vegetables at once, 
and having them all ripe at once, maybe you'll want to plant them over time. This is more common with uh, cool season vegetables and warm season vegetables, because warm season vegetables, you're harvesting fruits and you'll be getting those tomatoes or squash over a period of months usually. But with your cool season crops like your greens and um, cauliflower and root crops, there's usually only one half harvest. When you pull up that beet, that's it. And so you may not want 12 cauliflower heads all at once and none for the rest of the year. So you might want to space out your planting so that things become right at different times um, so that you can have continuous crop. Like lettuce, I usually do three or four plantings through the winter, about a month, six weeks apart each in rows. So that I always have some lettuce, not just a whole bunch of lettuce and then none. So if you do that, that means you're going to have to leave part of your plot vacant and say, okay, that's that's where I'm going to put my beets later or my um, cauliflower later. Um, for summer, I usually do uh, one other planting. If I put in my squash or peppers or tomatoes in April, I might do a second planting in maybe July. But you usually just have to do one more planting um, because they usually last a few months and produce for several months. So that's another thing to consider. Am I going to do successive planting? Uh, and the last thing to consider that you might not have the space to do is consider crop rotation. And what that has to do is there are certain pathogens, diseases, particularly soil-borne pathogens that attack particular families of plants. And if you plant that same type of plant from that same plant family in the same plot every year, there's the risk, doesn't always happen, the risk that that pathogen can build up. If you're growing a tomato in one place and the first year you get them eight feet and the next year they're only going to get six and the year after that you get to four, probably it's because you're building up some soil pathogens that are starting to attack um, your tomatoes. And so with, stop, with crop rotation is you just don't grow crops in that family in the same place every year. Now, if you only have one small plot, you can't really do crop rotation. I have several raised beds. And so I'll plant plants. I have a schedule of which plants in which family go in which bed each year. And I rotate it around the, the beds. And I won't get into all the crop families, but the one I'll mention that you most likely run into is a Solanaceae family, also called a nightshade family. That family has hundreds of plants in it, but there are four in particular that are vegetables, summer vegetables. And I remember by TEP, T-E-P-P, -P, it's tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and potatoes. Tomatoes, eggplants, peppers, and potatoes. All four of those, are all part of the same family. So you plant tomatoes one year and peppers the next year, you're not doing crop rotation. So I plant my tomatoes and peppers together in the same area and move them together to a different area each year. My potatoes, I do those in a separate a pot or, or barrel. Um, and if it's unlikely that diseases will build up in that because it's just, there's no native soil there. And if it does get bad, I can dump the soil out and put new soil in. Um, so crop rotation is something to consider. But once again, for your planting plan, you think about what do I like to eat? Is this the right season for it? If I got proper spacing, am I going to do successive planting? And, am I, and is crop rotation an, an option? Um, and also, when you do plant things, I recommend that we record what you plant, what variety of tomato was that, where did you get it? Um, and then at the end of the year, you can see how well that did and decide whether you want to do that again. Um, there are hundreds of varieties of tomatoes, and I always keep logs for years of which ones I planted and which ones have done well and which ones um, haven't done well. Okay. Doing okay right now? No questions that we have to do? Okay. Good. All right. Um, so, so now you've got your soil right. You know which plants you're going to plant. You know when you're going to plant them, where you're going to plant them. The next question is, are you going to do the starter plants? Or are you going to start from seeds? There's advantages and disadvantages to each. Started plants usually are like you know six packs like this, or four inch pots like this that you can get it. Um, the advantage of that is it got the plants hardy to that point. You don't have to try to germinate them and get them not eaten before they get to that size. Um, and so that's the easiest way to get started. Also, the plants have a certain amount of maturity to them. They could be a month old or so, so that you're going to get your crops sooner. 
uh, for beginning gardeners, oftentimes they opt to just do plants and not try to do seeds because it's easier and they'll have crops sooner. Um, but there are advantages to um, seeds. One is price. A package of seeds, yeah, this one, onion, is $2.79. Usually a package of seeds, which has more, more seeds than you're going to need. In fact, seeds, depending on the variety, will last one to five years. So you're going to have all the seeds you need for all the plants you want for years to come. And a package of seeds costs less than one plant for a six pack. This usually costs you four to five dollars. This should be two to three dollars. So it's certainly a lot cheaper vegetables from seed than it is um, from starter plants. Um, another advantage of seeds is that you can buy them online, which means you have a larger variety of vegetables you can grow. When you go to the nursery, there's a limited number of vegetables available and a limited number of varieties of vegetables. Um, there are hundreds of varieties of tomatoes. If you want to grow purple carrots or striped tomatoes or some exotic vegetable, you're not going to find it in the nursery, but you can get it online. Um, I have some trouble growing tomatoes that live on the coast, so I need ones that'll do well in, in cool weather. So I've ordered tomato seeds from Siberia, literally from Siberia, because um, I know they'll do in a cool climate there, you know. So you have a lot of broader choice in the vegetables you grow and the varieties you do with seeds. The other advantage is unlike the plants, they come with instructions. And the most important ones are how deep do you plant the seeds, um, which is usually about three times the size of the seed and can be anywhere from an inch, a quarter, eighth of an inch deep to an inch deep. They tell you how long it'll take for it to sprout typically, to germinate, and how many days it's going to take to harvest, and how the plants should be spaced out um, when, when they're fully grown. So you got instructions as well. Okay. Um, typically, I found that the bigger ones, bigger plants like tomatoes, peppers, um, uh, broccoli and cauliflower, ones that take longer to develop, I'll sometimes buy plants just because from seeds, particularly tomatoes from seeds can take a long time from seed to grow up. Uh, usually in the spring, I'll buy some starter tomatoes and start some tomatoes by seed at the same time. So by the time my seeds get to a decent size, the other ones are you know, senior citizens aren't doing so well anymore. And, and I've got my uh, uh, new tomato plants I'm going strong. Um, now, if you decide to do from seeds, you have to decide, am I going to do this in the ground or indoors? Um, if you do it in the ground, you have to decide, are, am I going to do single plants, which you usually do for larger plants. All your summer crops and bigger plants usually have single plants, single tomato plants. But for smaller plants like root crops and greens, you usually plant them in a row. So you usually make a hole to the depth that it says to make the seeds, which can be pretty small. And then you put the seeds along there and cover it up and water it in. Now, some seeds are really tiny, like um, lettuce seeds, onion seeds are really tiny, and it can be hard to pick up little seeds one at a time. So one thing you could do, you don't need to, is get a little uh, seed spreading device like this. And this, there's a lid that comes off and you put the seeds in there and then you twist the dial to the sides of the seed so they don't come out too quick. And then you kind of tap it and the seeds will go down and hit these little speed bumps so they don't speed. And when you get to the end, they'll fall off one or two seeds at a time. And you can just go down the road tapping like this and get all the seeds down your row really easily. So you don't have to do that, but I found it's a, it's a device that can really help with planting small seeds in rows. Now you always plant more seeds than you're going to have plants, and when they come up, then you thin them. Um, and thinning, if if you've got a lot of plants coming up tight, like a lot of lettuce seeds all together, it can be a little tough to get in there and uh, um, and thin them out so they're properly spaced. Another uh, thing you could do with that is use some very fine snippers called needle nose, some kind some call forest or florist snippers, because these I can go in there and I can snip off the ones that I, the sprouts that I don't want to grow. If you snip them off the ground level, they won't grow back. And it's easy to kind of thin out densely packed area of the sprouts to get down to the one you want remaining. So that you don't have to buy one of those, but just I find that helpful. 
Um, so that's planting seeds in the ground. Uh, there's a couple of problems that you can have with planting them in the ground. One is the seeds need to stay moist continuously. And for some seeds like lettuce, the proper uh, planting depth is an eighth of an inch. It can be difficult to keep an eighth of an inch of soil moist all the time, you know? I mean, you're gonna have to water every day, maybe even twice a day. This has been a problem in community gardens where people don't go to the community garden every day. They can be there not there often enough to keep their, their seeds moist. because so they need to be moist to sprout. And once they sprout, if they go dry, they'll die and no matter what, amount of water is gonna bring them back. So one thing is if you do plant in the soil, particularly for the smaller seeds on the surface, you've got to keep them moist. The other problem with, with planting in the soil from seeds is that you can come out one day and say, all right, my lettuce is coming up, that's great. And you come back the next day and say, I thought my lettuce was coming back, where'd it go? That there are little critters that can come out in the night, that can eat your plants down to the ground. Snails, slugs, earwigs, cutworms, they always come out at night. And if they eat it off down to the ground, it's dead. I mean, when the plant gets mature, a few holes in the leaves, not a big deal. But if a sprout gets eaten off uh, to, to the ground, it's dead. Um, one tip, tip on that one, I do that if I, if, I, if I see that something's eating my, eating my new sprouts, is I cover them at night. This is just a plastic cup. I drill some holes in the bottom and I set them right next to my plants. And before it gets dark, I just put one of these over the top of each plant. When I get up in the morning, I just take them all off and set them next to the plant for the next night, because this will keep the insects from being able to get to your sprouts. Uh, and they and usually when the plant gets too big to, to be in here, then I can take this off and any damage that, get, that happens to it, um, you really don't need to worry about it. It's not gonna kill the plant. I'll talk more about pest control and, and how to exclude pests from your gardens, uh, but that's just one tip since we're, I'm touching on that. Now, if you, um, now if you wanna grow, the other way to start seeds is to do it indoors. And the way you do that, is you some container. I like a six pack. You fill it with some um, potting soil till you find the right amount. Finer potting soil is better. Then you dump it in a container, get it moist, put it back in here, and then you put your seeds at the proper depth. If they're really shallow seeds like um, lettuce seeds, you can put a few on top and then sprinkle a little planting mix on top and then mist it to get it wet. Um, and usually plant, anytime you're planting seeds, you plant three or four, because about 80% germination rate's good, but you know, um, but uh, um, you want extras there to make sure you have enough and then you thin it down to one. Then you cover it with plastic wrap, wrap and just keep it in your house out of the sun. The temperature in your house, about 65 to 75 is a good temperature for germinating. You usually have to put it on a, a pan or something in case it's dripping out the bottom. If you don't water it, it's moist. You know in the, on your package about when it should start sprouting and you check. Once the first one sprouts, then you take the plastic off and put it in a sunny location a sunny window, or I put mine on a patio table outside because then it's gonna need sun immediately. Um, once the plants get to about the size, a couple inches tall as they are at the uh, um, nursery, then they're ready to transplant into the ground. Um, okay, a few tips on shopping for plants. Um, one is when you go to the nursery to buy plants, make sure a six pack actually has six plants. Might look green over the top, but sometimes one's dead. Another thing is that uh, if there's an extra plant in there, if all of all of them have one plant, but this one has two, you think, all right, I can get two plants for the price of one. Not a good idea. Those two plants are not properly spaced. If you try to separate them, you tear the roots off. So if there's so six packs, you have six plants, not five, not seven. Single plants, you have one plant, not two. Two does not a better deal. Two plants planted that close together will do, do nearly as well as a single plant by itself. The only exception to that is if all of the pots have two or three plants in it, which can be the case with squash, Swiss chard, and a few others, that means they're meant to be planted that close together and you can plant them all together and not space them out and you'll be fine. Um, when you're planting in the ground, you should have moist soil, not soggy, wet, not dry. 
you just dig a hole, usually with a tray, spade or trowel like this, dig it to that this will fit in and you can actually set this to see if you've got the hole right. Then it's best not to pull the plant out like this or you might get just the plant with no roots. It's best to put your hand over the top of the plant coming out the top, turn it upside down, kind of loosen it, lift it like this, and then turn it upside down into the hole that you just made. For six packs, obviously you can't turn it upside down with one plant or the fall five will fall out, but you do turn it sideways like this and gravity is not working against you. And here you will have to grab the stem, but then you kind of pinch the back or maybe even push it a little to kind of ease it out and then pop it down there, pat it in, water it in, and you got your plants in the ground. Oh, let's see what we can cover. Um, Okay, um, let's talk watering and fertilizing, and then we'll maybe have a little time for pests. Um, with watering, if you if you got rainwater, that's better than our tap water. Our tap water is very hard water. There's a lot of uh, minerals dissolved into that. Tap water is fine. It has chlorine in it. Uh, rainwater is better. I have rain barrels, and one thing that's priority is the gar uh, the garden. Um, but for most people, for most of the time, you're going to be watering with a garden hose. It's important that you have, that you don't just have an open hose spraying hot water out. It's going to break up the soil and water goes everywhere as you're moving around. So you need to put something on the hose to regulate the flow so you can shut it off and turn it as turn on as you need. Um, one option is a sprayer, but I wouldn't recommend it for a couple of reasons. One is it restricts the flow coming out to spray. And so it takes a lot longer to get enough water out there to water the crop. Also, you, you don't, you want to avoid getting the leaves wet. You just want water in the soil, not in the leaves. Wet leaves can get bacteria and mold, and you're more likely to get um, water on the leaves with this. Um, also, because it has a slower flow, sometimes people get the ground moist and think they've watered well enough. When usually, it depends on your soil, but Usually it takes about an inch of water to go down a foot depth. And you want water to go all the way through the, uh, the area um, where the roots are. Um, so what I like to use is something that has a surface like this. It's called a rain or shower. Um, it has a lot of little small holes. It, the flow is really good. It doesn't come out strong. And if you have a long one like this, you can water without having to bend over. And there's an on off switch here. You can regulate how much is into it. You can, however, you get the water on the plants, that's fine. But I like to use this because I can get it down low onto the soil, quickly do all the watering about it, hurry up the soil because it's coming out and uh, it's more softly. Um, um, drip irrigation is an option, but um, I'm not going to get into that. And um, it's more often used for ornamentals where things are the same. In your vegetable garden, things are going to be changing and shifting. Um, one other thing when you water is you should water the entire plot, not just around the plant. You want the entire area wet so that the roots of the plant will be continuously going into moist, fertile soil. So you water all of the area, not just around your plant. OK, I think you're good. Best to water in the morning, but not necessary. Um, if the plant's wilted, that usually means it needs more water, but there's an exception to that. On really hot, dry days, sometimes the plant's simply unable to draw up water as fast as it leaves out of the leaves, and so it will wilt. And no matter how much water you get, it's just going to stay wilted, so don't overwater. Once the sun starts to set, the leaves will come back and you'll be fine. So a little wilting on a hot day is okay and doesn't necessarily mean you're short of water. Um, fertil on fertilizing, um, you always fertilize, like I said, the entire area when you first plant. Um, and then for your winter crops, you usually don't need to fertilize again, particularly for root crops. The life cycle is pretty short. The, the plants are pretty small. They don't need more fertilized. But the only ones that might need more fertilizer is uh, broccoli or, or peas. Uh, but the summer crops last a lot longer and some are heavy feeders like tomatoes, corn. And so for those, after about uh, um, four to six weeks, you might wanna add a little more fer fertilizer. 
and you just work it gently into the soil. Or another option rather than working into the soil is when you're fertilizing with established plant, because you don't want to disturb the roots, you can use a liquid fertilizer. They usually come in a concentrate. It tells you how much to mix with water and you can pour it and that fertilizer will sink down. The fertilizer, here's one here. That's primarily nitrogen and what you need. Uh, the only thing I say with that, um, don't fertilize before you have your garden party because it smells like fish and it stinks for a couple of days. So I wouldn't put your uh, fish emulsion full fertilizer there when you're about to show your garden. Uh, okay, so that's fertilizing. Um, let me say just a few things about pest control. Um, if you have any questions about harvesting, I can cover that, but most of it's straightforward. Um, expect that you're probably going to get some pests. You're at the bottom of the food chain. Some insects are going to come around. If you see some bug on your plant, that's not necessarily a pest. It could be a insects just resting there, or it could be a beneficial insect. It's feeding, like lady beetles will feed on aphids. And so you don't, just because you see a, a creature on your plant doesn't mean it's a pest. You should usually uh, have a pest problem means that there's something getting eaten or there's a lot of spots on your leaves. Um, and the way to, and you need to identify that you have a pest problem. And every time you water, every time you're harvesting, every time you're weeding, um, always be looking for signs of pests because the earlier you catch it, the easier it is to solve. If it looks like you have a pest problem, you need to find out what that pest is before you do anything about it. Um, and the best place thing to help you with that, and it's on it's on this handout here that has some lists of resources, including the um, Master Gardener. In fact, this has the Master Gardener hotline um, and, and email address, which is better to use than bug, bugging the people at Sonoma Valley because they also have a, a phone number and email address, but don't use this one. Use the one for San Diego so that they're talking about our area. Um, but this is the, the website um, that you go to figure out what your pest is. It's the um, Integrated Pest Management um, website um, put on by the UC system. And it will, you, you can, it's an amazing website if you have, if you never used it. They actually have people who work full time just on this website. It's for home gardeners, it's also for commercial farmers in the state of California to identify and manage pests. And you can go in there and check, click off um, what you want to have here in my thing. You can click that you want home garden, vegetables, name your vegetable, and it'll give you a list of all of the pests that that could have, which can be intimidating. It'll list invertebrates like insects, vertebrates like critters, diseases, environmental disorders. And if you see one you think that it is, you can click on it and you go to the pest notes, where it has pictures of the pest, describes its life cycle, the damage it does, and how to control it in a responsible organic way. Uh, there's also uh, on that website a uh, under tools, a plant problem diagnostic tool, and it'll say what kind of plant this is, is this, and it'll give a list of plants and you check that, and it'll say where do you see the damage on the plant, and then you, you know, like say leaves, and it'll say what does it look like, and it'll show you a whole bunch of pictures of what that damage would look like on that plant, on that part of the plant, and you find the one that matches up with your the damage you see, and it'll once again tell you what that disorder is. You go to the pest notes and um, identify what that is. Um, and I think I will leave it at that. If you have any other questions, I want to leave time for a few questions here. Um, and if there aren't any, I'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about pest control or even, I mean, I can talk on this for hours. I love talking veggies. Um, <laughs> Thank one thing you so I will much. say, but, but let me say one thing though. Um, I've done this talk many times in many places. And for beginning vegetable gardeners, it can feel overwhelming. I mean, I gave a lot of information, a lot of different techniques, and they can be like, oh my God, you know, I, I can't do this. In fact, just about a year ago, I did this talk at a, a community garden. And afterwards, there's this elderly woman that came up that just rented a plot. And she says, 
I didn't realize vegetable gardening is so complicated. I don't think I can do it. And I said, hey, look, just go to the nursery, buy a little bag of fertilizer, see what vegetables, plants they have for sale that you want, because nurseries usually will sell vegetables that are appropriate at that time. Spread a little fertilizer on the ground, put your plant in the water, put your plant in the ground in water. That's all you got to do. Buy a plant, fertilize, stick in the ground, water. So that's all the basics that you need to do. Uh, everything else is just techniques to maximize your success and satisfaction to make it most likely the plants will go big and strong and produce a lot. But it can be as simple as just sticking a plant in the ground from the nursery and watering it. So, you know, don't feel like you have to remember everything I said today to uh, have success. Um, okay, questions? Yes, I see several questions. questions. Uh, Shirley, did you want to read through them? I may have to leave right at 11. So if, if you would be able to read through the questions. Okay, we have um, a few questions in the chat. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read those to you. Can we plant seeds directly in the ground? And I think you did tell us that. Yeah, in the ground versus some, in the house. Oh. What are some reasons that seeds don't germinate? Um. Well, um, not the not moist all the time, wrong temperature, wrong season, or bad seeds. I'd say those are the top ones. Do that. Um, I would if it's not doing into the ground. I definitely would try it in the house. Sometimes I'll do both. If I know I have problems in the ground, I'll plant them in the ground and start them in the house at the same time. So if they don't work on the ground, I've got them in the house. Uh, you can buy heat pads to heat them up to to an ideal temperature around 70 degrees, but you don't re usually need that. Um, but usually those are the reasons, moisture, temperature, um, wrong time of year, um, or bad seeds. Thank you. How much weeding in a vegetable garden is required? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, anything that's growing there that you didn't plant, take it out. <laughs> Ideally, your vegetable garden would be weed free. And the thing with weeding, actually the IPM work website actually has a thing on weeds as well. It'll identify your weed and tell you how to handle that weed. Uh, but if you pull up your weeds before they go to seed, eventually you'll have no more weeds coming up. There'll be no more weed seeds to germinate unless, some, unless something blows in, which doesn't happen often. But yeah, no, ideally keep it weed idea. free. It's just competing with your plants for nutrients and using up your fertilizer. Okay, how often do you fertilize your vegetables during their lifespan? Every four to six weeks? I think I think I covered that. For for yeah. for cool season crops, you don't have to re-fertilize or not. For the bigger plants, you do it about every four to six weeks, which just means one or two um, fertilizing periods. That's like tomatoes, squash, the, your summer more vegetables. Here's a very specific one. How to get rid of mold on a tomato plant. Is it okay to eat the tomatoes when the um, leaves and stems have mold? Um, well, I'm assuming that you're probably talking about powdery mildew. If the fruit itself is actually moldy itself, rotten, then you, know, you don't want to eat it. But if it's a, a white powder that's on usually not on the fruit, it's usually on the leaves. Um, um, you can use a horticultural oil like neem oil to spray on that and it'll, that's probably the best. There's other approaches, but um, but you can check I, uh, on the IPM <laughs> website, um, integrated pest management website for more details. But, but yes, if it's just on the surface, you can rinse it off. Usually it's more likely to be on the, um, now, if it's a fruit now in the winter, one problem with tomatoes is they take so long to ripen, literally months, that by the time you get to it, the skin can be all crusty and horrible looking because it's been sitting there in the elements for months, literally months. That won't happen in the summer. It'll ripen more quickly and you won't have this old crusty surface on it. Well, thank you. That covers the chat questions. Does anybody else have a question okay. you'd like to voice now? Okay. If not, I'll, I'll make a couple of other comments um, about harvesting. And there's one concluding remark I want to make. We're okay on time? Yeah, we got a couple minutes, right? Yes. Um, 
One tip on harvesting for your summer, harvest regularly. Um, don't let your zucchinis get two feet long and weighing 10 pounds. Um, if you harvest your, your um, particularly with peas and beans, if you harvest regularly, it'll keep producing more. So you usually don't want the fruit to get too big, big and rot on the vine. If you're not gonna eat it, take it off. Vegetables will store in the refrigerator, except for tomatoes that you shouldn't put in the refrigerator unless you have to, to preserve them. Uh, for winter crops, always harvest before they bolt. Most, all your root crops, greens, um, will bolt eventually, which means from the center of the plant, it'll send up a single stem straight up. It'll have flowers. It'll um, go to seed. And I let some bolt just so I'll have seeds for next year. As long as they're not hybrids, the seeds are really good. But once it starts to bolt, it's past prime and it should be harvested. Um, if you let root crops bolt, they become um, less sweet and fibrous and tough. Lettuce will start tasting bitter. So harvest before it bolts is one tip on for there for, for winter crops. Um, okay, I'm just gonna uh, conclude one story that was uh, told to me uh, about a year ago by a participant in a talk that came up after me and said, just told me this is a true story. She said she knew this woman who really enjoyed gardening her whole life. It just brought a great deal of joy. And eventually she got Alzheimer's, really bad, disorganized, forgetful, really, you know, not functioning well. But even in that disabled state, when she was out in the garden, it brought her great joy just to be out there and play around with the garden, had a great time. Unfortunately, on one day, her family saw her out gardening and she'd forgotten to put her clothes on. And so they had to put her in a memory care center. Um, so my hope for us is that we'll all enjoy gardening like her for many years to come until they catch us doing it naked. <laughs> so thanks for listening. Uh -huh.